Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Customizing Culture podcast. My name is Jared Barbosa. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by two incredibly special guests. We're so stoked for this special collab episode. I'm John Phenom here from Non Beta, and I have Kenji from I Can Do It. Dot studio. You guys, thank you so much for coming out, man. Thanks for having us. For yeah. sure, Jared. Anything Thanks. for you. Oh. Anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here in beautiful downtown LA. Uh, might grab some tacos after this, but more importantly than tacos, today we're going to be talking about streetwear, but about so much more than that, about starting your own brand. So to kind of kick things off, I have to ask, what do you guys think about the term streetwear? Do you think like, like, oh, let me start with this. What defines something as streetwear? What makes it streetwear? <clears throat> so I think whoever starts the brand, if they just, if they call it streetwear and it's in within the bounds of it, uh, I think you can call it streetwear. I, th- I think you, you can label your brand that. For me, in terms of a definition, um, I would say it's a, a casual, ready to wear men's or women's brand. But, um, you know, you could kind of, it's a great territory. Like if, if, if I would consider it an athleisure brand, but they're like, but the owner says it's a streetwear brand. I, I kind of go with whatever they're going to tag it with. But what do you think? Yeah. I think the term has been obviously kind of overused in my yeah. personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously like everything come from the streets. Like, you know, not that I was there, obviously it's like the nineties and eighties when I wasn't even born yet. Or I was a very, very small lad, but yeah, I think, you know, taking street culture and it's become applied to this general public and people just kind of refer to the look and the aesthetic as streetwear. Mm. But I do think like, you know, things evolve as time changes. Like we can't always be super street and kind of go in that direction. But I think you got to remember where it came from. Yeah. And I think like calling your brand a streetwear brand is fine, but I think everyone calls their brand a streetwear brand. Yeah. And just as someone who runs ads and sees ads, like I see everyone saying, oh, new streetwear brand dropping March 3rd or, or whatever. And it's like, I think you can use a better word to describe what your brand's about. So I, yeah. so I do think like attaching yourself with that is a good way to reach the general public, but it doesn't really speak volumes of like what your brand is about. Okay. So, yeah. so kind of building off of that, do you think the terms played out? Do you think it's burnt? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, so I was thinking about this in the drive here, but I think like when people call something streetwear in like, and if you do clothing it's generally when someone else refers to your brand as that, like they see it and they go, this is a streetwear God. brand. So but it's the not person, something you call yourself. Yeah. The okay, order does, like it, Supreme it. doesn't go over a streetwear brand. Right, like right. they're a skate right. company. Right. Or skate, right. I mean, now they're obviously very ingrained, you know. But like, I was thinking about this, like, like Palace is skateboarding, Kip is like, you know, lifestyle and whatever Ronnie wants to do. Um, but yeah, I just think like when people refer to a brand, it just gives it like a general image of what it's about. Like you said, like general men's and female, yeah. you know, cuts that are unisex, and you can wear it anywhere pretty much nowadays. And I think like that's what streetwear has become. But I think when you trace it back to where it started, it's probably changed a lot from that right and yeah. i think and one thing that i've observed kind of that i think is cool about street is that kind of anything can be street wear if you wear it on the street right. like you have like kids like wearing like carhartt now yeah. like i feel like the the bass pro shops well i'm sure bass pro shops is not a street wear store right. you're kind of seeing it on the streets and i think that's pretty cool yeah i think um same thoughts right that i, I have the same thoughts when i was coming over here but like i might talk to someone they they would it's such a vast definition, right? Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Definitely got to recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, someone might say, uh, like, Supreme is like a core streetwear brand, but because they're going to be mentioned in like all the hype beast posts, uh, whatever media you might uh, think is speaking to streetwear, which is, I think, largely is a big sneaker culture as well. I also think of the word hustle immediately, just kind of like yeah. it's intertwined. Where like, oh, I'm just hustling these t-shirts. It's almost like out of my trunk, but then I don't know, like is, is essence of, or like uh, essentials or fear of God is like, I, I'll hear some people say that that's streetwear, but is it high end men's premium? Would they say that? I, I don't know. So it's like, it's pretty broad for me. Yeah. And it is played out though. And what streets are you wearing essentials on? Cause that's expensive. Yeah. You know? <laughs> essentials, like, a, like a dude that's a hustler might say, oh, like everyone, if we go down there, like people are rocking. They have an essentials crew neck. Everyone has yeah. one, right? But it's like they're going to put their apparel on a runway, right? If you look at their media, like yeah. think of what they put out into the internet. Like it's very high end premium, but uh, a hustler is going to wear it. So is it like the audience who who kind of is in, is in touch with it? Like, again, it's, it's so broad. Yeah. It's kind of like when we were growing up, like it's like 
metal, right? Metal music is like everybody, there was bands that were kind of on the edge and it's just like, is that bad metal? You get into fights with your friends. Like they're not metal. They're so metal. And it's just like, you're, or what's punk and what's not punk. It's like if you once you start breaking it down, you realize like, oh, okay, yeah. it's a kind of a more broad definition than what both people might think, right? So now let's talk about kind of how it was. So like, I love t-shirts. I like my whole life. I I, I cannot believe I'm not wearing a t-shirt today. I was getting, I was half asleep when I got dressed this morning, and so I'm just like, I, I'm driving over, I'm like, sh- should have worn a t-shirt. But any, but you know, so like. What was your kind of like first experience with the brand, streetwear or not? Although, again, because it's such a broad definition, right? What was your first experience with a brand where you were like, I, I scored this shirt, I scored these sneakers, and you were just the coolest kid on the block in, in your own mind or in reality? Like, it's always in your own mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. Uh, John, you want to go first? Or I can. Uh, please. Yeah, please. I feel like you might go deeper than me. So I decided <laughs> to hit it off. But yeah, so I'm a 90s kid, right? So I grew up with like watching like. You know, 50 Cent, Eminem, like, when Fat Farm and yeah. Echo, oh, uh, what else, Jinko Jeans, can make a comeback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, that was... Oh, please keep those away, though. No, no. <laughs> yeah, see, I can't rock those because I'm short. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think, like, that era was, you know, very gangster rap. Like, people yeah. rapping in front of their pimped out um, Escalades and shit. And I think, like, that was the culture back then. Like, that's what people looked at as, like, cool. So I think, like, that generally flowed to the public of, like, you know, like me, a suburban kid in Hawaii wanting to wear, like, Echo, right? It's yeah. kind of, like, not street at all. But, you know, that's, like, the influence that we had, um, especially because, like, talking about Hawaii, Hawaii was, like, very closed off back then, you know? Like, the internet wasn't as prevalent as now. Social media wasn't a thing. So it's, like, what we had was, like, what we saw from the friends who came from the mainland who had something cool, and you're, like, where'd you get that? You know, or, like, I mean, internet was already past dial-up, thankfully. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'll go on eBay. I'll see, like, Puma. Because I used to be B-Boy. So I was, like, you know, a dancer. And, like, B-Boys were, like, Puma, like, Romas and stuff. And uh, Suede, Puma Suede. So it's, like, I don't know. I thought that was streetwear. And then slowly but surely, like, new stores started opening in Hawaii. Like, this store called uh, Metro Park, I think. Do you guys remember that one? Yeah. Yeah. It was a big chain. Yeah. Um, they had, like, Diamond, uh, you know, Stussy. LRG, like all these brands. And I was like, oh shit, this is where you buy this from. Because like, you didn't know, you know, that your information was so limited to what you saw every day that that was all I knew. So slowly but surely I started like recognizing, oh, I can get this from here, this from there. And then um, I had this one Echo shirt that I bought from uh, Australia. We had a field trip. I don't know why our field trip was in Australia. Oh yeah. But you took a field trip to Australia? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty rad. It's an interesting partnership because I was like a freshman in high school, right? I was like, what is that, 15 years old or something? Right. But my... My parents were like, if you go to this one, you can't go to the next one. So I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm a freshman, I want to go. And then uh, me and my friend bought this Echo shirt. I think it was like $45, Australian, I think. Yeah. I don't know what the trend, you know. It's a lot back then. Yeah. It's, it still is a lot. But, you know, that was the first shirt that I bought that I was like, wow, this is really nice. Because it had like a raised like puff, like print. Or I don't even know if it was puff. It was like, I don't know, did they use puff? They used puff back then, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was different, though, from what I remember. It was more like a soft, like, foam-looking thing. Maybe like a 3D foam kind of embroidery. But that was the first time I owned something like that, and that made me feel really cool. <laughs> Whether people thought yeah. or not, but I was like, damn, like, <laughs> I finally got something that, like, I saw the people wearing. And that had, was like... You had a new walk when you go back to school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that, was, that shirt's pretty iconic. Um, I think I still might have it. I don't know. It might be in the closet somewhere at home. You gotta, if you do, you got to post about it. <laughs> got to. <laughs> the Echo T. But yeah, I think that was, like, the one piece that I remember really well. Uh, my, so my first T-shirt was actually it was gifted to me. So um, on our podcast interview, we went. We, no one's ever gone that deep about <laughs> about my career. But so I met this guy after my senior year in high school. Who he actually worked for. So DC Shoes had Dub and Drawers uh, back when it was independently owned by Ken Block and his partner uh, Damon Way. And so they hired him. He had actually worked on Fat Farm. He was one of the him and Eli Gessner had worked with Russell Simmons on Fat Farm, and they, they moved him from New York to Cali to come work. And so that's the first time I met an apparel designer, and I was like, this is, this is the best job in the world. Like, I basically don't have to grow up. It was crazy. Mm-hmm. So he showed me the, the design department, uh, sampling, and then when we went to the warehouse, he just he gifted me, like, six drawer shirts. And I just, I, I just wore them till they were tatted. <laughs> And then Aliasha went on to to start. There's gotta be there's gotta be a video here somewhere in the future. But he did the best company that never really hit its fame. But it was called Alphanumeric. Yes, Alpha I remember that. Yeah. So yeah. 
for two was years. Was that a skate brand? I it was. Some of the skaters were rocking that in a lot of the video. Yeah, so part yeah. of his strategy, so Ali Asha, like godfather of, of streetwear, um, and he's, he's a historian, he's super intelligent, he's an amazing creative director, but so he comes from, like, he's really good friends with most deaf, which is crazy. Um, and so, like, he knows all these people from New York on the hip-hop side, but also came from being a sponsored skater in New York. So um, Alpha Numerics um, have to mention that uh, once he launched that brand, which was in San Diego, where I grew up, um, I got gifted a shit from there, and that was super treasured. Like, still to this day, like, the brand was way ahead of its time. Imagine Alpha Numeric now with technology and internet. Um, but when that shirt, that was like, that was like crazy for me. But all the brands like you mentioned, and I think of back in the day, like Fresh Jive, uh, Rick Klotz one time designed a season where I wanted everything from that season. So it's true where the way we do brands now is so different, which is what we're touching on here. But yeah, I totally remember not only t-shirts, but entire collections, which totally spurred me to become a apparel designer. Nice. I remember for me, Super. I was so I, as a kid, I was super heavily influenced by the skate scene. Yeah. So like Thrasher magazine, Transworld magazine. That's where like anything that I wanted, I would get the inspiration from there. So when I got my first DC shirt, mm-hmm. I just was like, I didn't even have the shoes to go with it yet. <laughs> so I was still rocking like my Ross Vans or whatever, right? And so, but like once I had that DC shirt, I was just like, guys, I'm here now. I made it, right? <laughs> yeah. And then and then from there, it was that first DC shirt. And so for us, it was. I didn't get a lot of exposure to like, because if there were cool stores in LA, like I wasn't going to them. I was growing up in San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, then so, but the cool, the stores with the cool clothes were the skate shops. And at the time, like tons of skate shops were opening all over the place. So like, so for like, for me, it was like, oh, there's skate brand. That's why you set off in America. I'm like, dude, I haven't heard that name in like a really long time. But yeah. So for me, it was that DC shirt. But then one day I went to the mall with my brother. I don't even know which mall, but they had this kind of, sneaker like streetwear store and then uh he bought this lrg jersey uh for some special because he's a musician so he's going to play some some big event at like six flags or whatever so he bought this lrg like jersey and it was probably i want to say he paid like 200 bucks for it and this is like 2001 maybe and i'm just like my brother's rich Like he's, he's making money yeah, somewhere. Like, he's so rich, and this is what rich, cool, because you know he's a musician. So I was really looking up to him. So like, this is what rich musicians wear. I have, and so from then on, like after that, like my neck, I like I had to get an LRG something. So once he had like an old LRG shirt that he was done with, I was like, <laughs> so you know, so I would like take like his cool clothes and stuff like that. And now it's reversed because now like he gets all my T-shirts because like I I purged I go through so many T-shirts like I purge T-shirts probably like once every two months. And so now I give him all my t-shirts because he, he loves them. So it's a <laughs> little well, full circle moment there. But yeah, it was it was that DC shirt and that LRG jersey. And to me, I was just like, it does not get cooler than that. And and so kind of thinking about like those old brands, like how much of that inspiration from those bands, from those early pieces, how much of that has kind of flowed through into what you guys are doing now, if, if at all? I think most of the inspo from, like, those brands were really hot in, like, early 2010, I think. Um, a lot of brands, like, all my mood boards were, like, those brands when I was mm-hmm. designing or having someone else design. But nowadays, I feel like the cut and the fit has been more the front focus versus, like, the graphics. Yeah. So I feel like graphic graphically, the inspiration is kind of all over the place right now. Like, I think there's no rules, which is really cool. But I do think, like, those brands kind of had its peak of, like, influence back then. Because, I mean, it's like 2024, right? So it's been yeah. 14 years, which is crazy. Like, <laughs> time doesn't stop, you know? But I just think, like, those brands, like, they'll always have their place in this world of apparel design and streetwear because, like, they brought us here today. But I do think, like, their direct influence isn't as big as it used to be. Yeah. But it's cool to see, like, I mean, Hundred still puts out, like, so much shit every week. Like, oh, yeah. they do, like, licensing stuff. And I'm like, how do they, how do they order so much? How do they sell so much? But... It's just cool because, like, yeah, I mean, Hunter is obviously, you know, legendary in the scene, and Bobby has done so much that yeah. we don't even know. So it's like, yeah. it's cool to see, like, those brands, like Diamond, I, I know, is still around. Um, yeah, I mean, Stussy, I think, has been like, they're not going anywhere ever. What's cool <laughs> about them is, like, I think they had some dark days, like, when they started selling at Urban Outfitter and stuff, because that was like the 2010s. And I remember I was like, man, like, is this what I remember Stussy's being, like, this, like, 
I don't want to say they sold out because obviously, like, you know, they got that distribution, which is awesome. But I don't know. It, it wasn't what I imagined anymore. But then, like, they kind of brought it back. Like, the last few seasons have been crazy. Like, they've been dropping so much good stuff. And, like, they actually sell out on the drop. And it's, like, cool to see that a brand that's, I don't know, 40 years now? 40 years old? And they're 80s, 50? yeah. What is 80s now? That's 50. No, 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 no. It's pushing 40. I'm 80s. <laughs> oh, 40. I'm 80s, bro. <laughs> pushing 40. Pushing 40. Can't, can't math in this situation. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, 40 years, like, and they're still relevant. Like, that's yeah. that's awesome. So yeah, Stussy's still killing it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you bring any inspo? Um, so, short answer is no. Um, but like, I was, I was, like, my whole career was like birthed in that world. Back when trade shows were like the place to be, not only for inspiration and then dropping a brand and and seeing what everyone was doing, right? It was like being at Vegas twice a year for spring and fall. Um, but now that the the internet exists, like the whole landscape of what you might think, like, like if you look at what like Hellstar is doing, right? It's just it has nothing to do with some of those things in the past, right? Like I I have a friend, he had a brand called Exact Science, and he's one of the few friends that I have that, that I know that literally retired from a streetwear brand. And so he sits on a catalog. It was, it was, if you remember that brand, so you probably don't, he called it, he called it the hentai brand. So the, the main thing they were selling was the graphic. It was graphic t-shirts. So he had one partner. They had pretty big distribution. Their margin was amazing. And he lives in San Francisco. Or they just moved, but he's, he what has been retired in San Francisco, California, one of the most expensive places. And like, he has a catalog of like a thousand graphics. And like, uh, the only reason I bring it up is like, Will those graphics hit today? I, right? Like, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's different. Um, and, like, uh, the two brands you brought up, uh, I have to say, like, the Stussy and Hundreds. So what what Ben and Bobby are doing with Hundreds is is such an outlier. Like, it's crazy to still be relevant and hot now. Yeah. It's so hard to yeah. do. Yeah, you look at a lot of those, like, 90s and early 1000s brands, and there's not a lot that have made it. Right. Uh, before this episode, I was going through like just you know just different research, just kind of brushing up on my art history, on my on my streetwear history, and I found this list by Complex, uh, his, his best uh, streetwear brands from the thousands, and like the only ones who were still around were like the last like I think top ten out of twenty fifty whatever it was, only a handful of the top ten were even still around, and I thought, dude, that's wild. Like, for brands to blow up and have lines around the block and all that. Yeah. And, like, in 2024, like, who's even still around? Like, that's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I feel it's, it's a different, it's a completely different landscape. Yes. Like, yes, it is. people who, are, who have no history of, like, kind of our aforementioned uh, conversation right now, they could still pop this year, next year, and do millions. Yes. Yeah. So, that's actually, dude, that's actually a really good point. So, like, how different do you feel it is starting up now? Do you think you could have made it back in the in 2001 or are you like grateful like no no i'm glad eh? i'm glad we're here in 2024 i would have no chance honestly yeah, really yeah i mean like like just going back to like being in hawaii right like right. my opportunities and what whatever was around me was very limited too so i think like i would have had to travel to california probably or new york and like take some hands chop it up and then make connections that way you know and like i wasn't really that like forward with like my sales and like my just public appear- appearances i like to just kind of design in my room and be you know that introverted design guy right yeah but in today's day and age like that doesn't get you very far um you can kind of make it work like you know if you guys follow my instagram like i do a lot of content where i don't really speak to the camera because i find that my videos just flow better if i don't i just kind of let the work speak Mm -hmm. you know and like that kind of methodology wouldn't have worked back then because you kind of yeah. be out there and you know chop it up and then make these connections yeah there, there was no social media back then no. i mean there kind of was depending Geo on how cities. far back you go yeah right Zanga. right oh my god asian <laughs> avenue <laughs> oh, I'm, get, I'm getting <laughs> we're getting junior high flashbacks <laughs> yeah man like i don't know how do you feel about like starting in 2024 well, you yeah. didn't start in 2024 no I, but I, having I, a brand in, in this year versus... yeah, yeah but uh yeah so basically launching on beta in 22 so I, I, I was at a point where, um, so I, I talk about this all the time. I had the name for probably like five years, but I didn't pull the trigger on it. Cause I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like, I don't have to do this. Like I'm on a good track. I'm going to retire. Like I'll be okay. But like, uh, obviously because of my, the basis of my YouTube channel is helping other brands. I was like, this would be good content. But, um, I kind of, at the end, it's like, there's so many things I could use it for as a vehicle. And so I did, I did launch it relatively recently, but 
yes, the strategy is completely different, right? So like if someone's starting a brand and um, they don't know half, they don't know uh, 70% of what I know about running an actual, like a multi-million dollar clothing brand, but they have a good, unique voice on short form content. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that person can make like Two t-shirts. They're, they're going to cut in line uh, so yeah. far ahead of everybody else. Right. Yeah. Right. I th- but I think, okay, my more complete answer, though, is the part where me and Kenji might have, like, a good lead on people is, like, being in this space, like, uh, knowing, having a longer vision of it, right? Like, um, you're not going to touch me operationally, right? Because I've made decisions for a multi-million dollar brand. So I think, like, more of the recent consulting that that i've done is like people asking okay like we popped i'm crazy big on tiktok like what do we do now that's where i feel like we might have an advantage um but if you're launching today completely different strategy yeah i was watching this video from bobby hundreds and uh bobby from the hundreds i feel like it goes by bobby hundreds yeah yeah, yeah. Did I say that right? yeah. but i was watching this video and and he was talking about how they were like kind of like fake it till you make it. Like they popped into that, he, you know, his famous story about he goes to Fred Siegel and's like, "Wait, you don't know the hundreds? And then he got all his homies to go in and buy that. And I feel like back then, like you had to do that. Like you had to have just this crazy level of like hustle. Like, yo, I'm gonna go hit the pavement. I'm gonna go make stuff happen, make deals happen. And nowadays, I feel like, like, yeah, like like you, like you guys have been saying, like, yeah, if you have a cool cool shirt, if you have a good product, you. can you don't have to leave your room except maybe to go to the post office to drop stuff off. But like you could really build something without having that. I don't want to call him insane, but there's a pretty crazy <laughs> level of commitment to the brand and commitment to the craft and, and commitment that, that those little guys have that like, I don't know if it's bad to say this, but you kind of don't need it. You don't need to be that hardcore in this day and age or maybe hardcore just looks a little bit different. I don't know. Yeah, I think it helps to have that same mentality, but I do think, like, it's become easier in the sense that, like, you just pop a video, take some pictures, and, like, if the algorithm favors you, you can yeah. have these opportunities that yeah. otherwise wouldn't have been there to begin with, you know? Kind of like what John said, too, like, us being in the industry, working with, like, you know, higher, like, net value clients and stuff, like, it gives us a different perspective because we're not just, like, I'm going to go buy a heat press and drop a brand. It's, like, we've worked with, you know, I, I never worked on, like, seven figures, but, you know, six-figure drops has definitely been a thing that I've done. But it's like, I never done that for myself yet, but I know what that looks like when I get there, you know, like logistically, operationally, like I've seen it so I can prepare for that versus like, if you just start all oh, the TikTok blows up and shit, it's like, <laughs> what do you do? You know, yeah. now you have, I don't know, 2000 orders, like you only have a That's heat press. a nightmare for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not saying that I got that, but you know, like, like that, if, you know, we had that problem, it'll be like, okay, contact a screen print shop. They can yes. print out for us. Yeah. Yeah. But a beginner might be like, I got to buy so much more DTS transfers oh, and get yes. another heat press. You know, it's I like they want three <laughs> call my friends. Yeah. Blow yeah. up the energy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 1600 watts. That's yeah. just, that's just yeah. crazy. Oh, dude, that's, that's such a good point. Like you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you guys have like a lot of like industry knowledge that you can put towards your own thing, mm-hmm. which, yeah, that's super valuable, man. I, yeah. I think, um, I think the one of the biggest differences from like owning a brand from now to then is like the whole key for surviving was retail. Like yes. right? Like your yeah. story was like we 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 you know, Metro Park opened up in Hawaii or like when you went to Australia, you guys saw a mall or went to a retail place where you're like, Oh, they have all the cool the cool shit here. So like back then it, life or death was getting into retail and yeah. those buyers were gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Two thousand. I can see that. It's like, oh, who's who's the new men's buyer at Tilly's? Who's the new uh, buyer at whatever whatever retail? Even if they had four in the chain, that's the only way you existed. But now, since everything is, the whole world's on the internet. If you just have a good presence there, then you have more than a fighting chance of having a successful brand. Yeah. Alrighty, guys. So I have a question, and this is as much for me as it is for anybody watching. What do you feel are some of the biggest challenges for people starting up? And let's just say brands, you know, not necessarily streetwear, but people starting up new brands, t-shirt centric brands in 2024, what are some of the biggest challenges you think they're going to be facing and what would be your kind of game plan to overcome that? First, oh, go, go, go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. no. You got it. I was going to say so far, my biggest challenge has been 
finding time to put in the work. Mm. Like, because, you know, like a lot of people out there, especially if they're starting out, uh, you know, because this is heat press nation, right? So a lot of people have heat presses. If you have a heat press, I feel like eight out of 10 times, you're probably going to be like a, like a weekend warrior mm-hmm. type situation. Or a late night grinder. Yeah, yeah, or a late night grinder, yeah. yeah. So for me, it's, it's definitely like finding the time to to focus on the brand and to focus on, on developing that after I get home from, from work and after I, you know, put the kid to bed and, and all that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to have a two-prong answer to this because okay. cause I'll, I'll consult with brands that are in two different fronts. So one is the person who has the logo and, and like really just kind of starting from scratch. And then the second uh, kind of person I'm talking to is like they're a year or so or two, three in it. So for the very novice, I think the biggest challenge is they're like, they're obviously social media is the key. For me, it's like, uh, it's like marketing and sales. So if you do really good storytelling, then people will feel in tune with it and it makes sales much easier because they're hitting buy on whatever device they're watching you. Um, so the, the question is, well, what do I post? So the answer that I get for that is I'm like, find three brands that are already out and killing it and reference what they're doing in social media. So like, how are they dropping their TikToks and uh, Instagram, et cetera? Like, what does their drop calendar look like for their social media management? And then literally forensically study it and go, okay, what can we take from that to then what, what our drops are going to be looking like? And for the second person who was already in it, um, like I said earlier, it's usually logistical. Mm-hmm. So like, how do you take that initial spark of success and, and make it a fire and make it, make it be um, a business that could pay for your mortgage? Nice. Free consulting for me right now. Oh, day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think similar to John, like social media has made everything easier in a sense, but it's also harder because it's now oversaturated as much as it could ever be, right? Like you can go to Kittle, Canva, you know, these free resources. I actually touched this on one of my videos, but it's great that the learning curve and entry point has really decreased of like how hard it is to start. But that means that you're competing against like a million of other people oh, who yeah. just started. So if you just take that same globe, uh, this globe logo has always been in my head from, uh, I think it's from Canva, but it's like this wireframe globe logo with like text that arcs around it. And I've probably seen at least like 50 brands that that's like their logo. And I'm like, man. <laughs> well, they just type their name in it. Yeah. And then they're like, this is going to be my logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> wow. yeah. And, and I see people run ads <laughs> on these pages shot. and I feel so bad for them because it's like, you know, they're wasting money. Like, mm-hmm. I, like I commend them for starting, obviously, but it's like, you need a longer game plan than just like, fucking Canva, let's just go run it. And then yeah, that's yeah. logo. You know, it's like, it's okay if you just want to do this casually. Because I think you got to start yeah. just because you like stuff, right? Not because I make millions. Like, that's what I yeah. touched on in the last video when we talked to. It's like, you got to do it because you love it, right? Because yeah. there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. And like, you know, I go through a lot of positive times and a lot of negative times. But it's like, the negative times, if you don't like it, you're just going to dip out and be like, I'm going to go get another job. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, if you really care, like you'll deal with it and then you'll find a new solution. And then like, you're like on this new peak again. And I think like people need to learn that as they invest them for time and effort and money into this, this career, because it's like, it's just not as simple as like, I'm going to post a video, go viral and sell this. It's yeah. like, if you want to, if you want longevity in this, like you have to really build a brand. And I think building a brand is very different from having good graphics. Unless you're like a Redbubble or, you know, whatever those sites. Not saying they have good graphics, but if you're just trying to sell graphic things, like, yeah. that's easy. But if you want people to actually follow you, care about you, and have longevity over, you know, these, like, 10, 15, 20-year periods, like, Susie Diamond, hundreds, like, you have to have an identity that people can grasp onto and then also, like, grow with you. And I think yeah. that's the advantage of now is, like, you know, my strategy has been to be the brand itself. Like, I can do it without studio is, like, the HQ, and I have vision and house, which have two different identities. But at the end of the day, like I'm still the guy that is creating the content, creating the shirts. Like I try to focus it around me as like kind of like I took this out of like the streamer book. But you know, streamers like people follow streamers because they like the person, yeah, or they learn their gameplay or whatever. Right? They follow them because they're a fan. And that was kind of like my thought process was like I want people to follow me because they can learn something from me, or they see that like oh what I'm doing is cool so they can try to replicate it and then hopefully have these opportunities that i got because i didn't know this was a job that you can actually have right kind of like you said like this is a fucking life you can choose yeah like like, you know that moment for me too like when i uh dropped actually it's funny the building around here i worked there for uh two years um as an engineer and after that um i went to another engineering job and then after that i started working in the clothing company like you know industry and 
that's when I realized you can have a job that's fun that you can actually make money with. And I think it all feels like this fantasy dream, like experience, but once you can find your foot in, like it's real and the grind is crazy. But after like two, three years, four years, it's like you start seeing that progress, like really build up. And I think that's what really kept me going. Nice. And honestly, I forgot what the initial question was. So <laughs> you need a little recap. Oh yeah. You know, so so that, that's no, honestly everything that's, that's really valuable info. And I know that what you guys are sharing here is going to help somebody out there to kind of go back to the question. Uh, so like, what are some unique challenges that you find that you think or you foresee brands are going to be facing in 2024, yeah. starting up new brands, new lines that probably did not exist 10, 20 years ago in the early days of streetwear? Gotcha. My bad. I got too passionate about no, it doing good, what you dude. love. <laughs> I love it, man. That's a great yeah. So I think yeah. like as long as you care about what you do, actually, um, I'm kind of mentoring this guy, uh, Jason. Shout out to Jason. But yeah, he just started his brand. Um, and, you know, I haven't seen him launch it yet. He says he's going to launch it in mid February. He hasn't. Big things coming. I still see him coming soon, but hey, we have meetings and <laughs> we have meetings. He's working on it. I yeah. see him putting in work and it's like, I respect that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think like, that's the kind of stuff you want to show is like you really working on something because people can resonate with that. You know, and I think that's like the social media angle that's a little different than like, here's cool lifestyle shots of me, like jumping off the building with my <laughs> shirt. You know what I mean? It's like, that's cool. And like, you know, hitting like six skate tricks is also cool, but I think, like, in this day and age, you don't have to go that route if you don't want to, and you can just create an experience that people can gravitate towards. I love it. What about you? What do you got? Oh, what do you uh, got for us? For, uh, for, like, challenge. Like, what are, like, some challenges you see that, like, in 2024, oh, new, new startup brands, they're going to hit these challenges. Like, so, so apart from uh, curating their, their social media, uh, which that's, like, I mean, even before we, we started shooting, you're saying yes. like you need to hire one person just to do that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that homework there alone is th- that'll be like months, right? Like your friend is gonna launch last month, but I think they realize how much work it's gonna be. And then once they get get into it, like if they if they're able to navigate the beginning launch of the brand successfully, their logistical prowess, like you don't know what to put time and energy into. Um, this is an anti hat, but like <laughs> if you. <laughs> If you don't love apparel, like want to have a brand, this is one of the most difficult businesses. Yes. Oh, ever. dude. Either do this yeah. or go start a restaurant. Two of the hardest things you're gonna. Well, so this is funny, but I remember um, I was speaking. I was I was flown out to Hawaii to speak. My friends were like, so I was there for you know clothing brand mentor John Phenom stuff. My friend was like, can you consult my friend for something else? And I was like, what? Like, I mean, I don't know if I could speak intelligently about what it is they need, what they thought of me. And so when I spoke to them and they had, they had some business questions, I was like, oh, that's easy because apparel is so difficult. It's so oh, difficult. Okay, yeah. yeah, it's like if you want to start like a SaaS company, like you can gauge uh, proof of concept like so much easier. Um, but in any of the like, I, I talk about like four pillars, like uh, design, sales, marketing, and production. Um, like there's so many challenges inside of all of it but that's why i say logistically um that's going to be just figuring out where to put your time and energy especially if it's after work is going to be the biggest challenge i love it how how important do you guys think it is because you know there's been lots of talk so far about like you have your logo and you and you want to conquer the world like how important of of course you got to have good artwork right nobody wants to buy an ugly freaking t-shirt but like how important do you feel it is for brands in 2024, in this new century, whatever, how important is it to have a strong brand identity or like aesthetic, you know? I think it's very important. I mean, can you live without it? Can brands like start like, we don't know what we're going to be yet. And like, do you think that exists? What I see a lot is I see a lot of copycats. I'm not saying like I don't use references either. Everyone does, you know, but like, for example, this brand called a Carte Blanche or something like that. Um, I saw them. I think this guy posted on Reddit. I saw him go from like 3,000 to like 50,000, 80,000, something like that. And like they do this two tone, uh, neutral, like snapback thing with like the big um, serif text, you know. And I saw another brand that just kind of took that same aesthetic, but it's like, this is our brand identity. And it's kind of like, I don't know. I know the word dupe gets thrown around a lot these yeah. days. Um, I think I don't, I'm not on TikTok, yes. <laughs> but from the, from the one video I've seen on TikTok, Tender, fine. <laughs> it's dupe. <laughs> yeah, and I think like people would just like to, I don't know. It's just easier to get someone if someone can reference another logo 
to think, oh, I like this because of that, right? Like Supreme, when Supreme was at, at its peak, like everyone did the box logo thing and like oh, yeah. Savage at Marshalls, you know, <laughs> whatever, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but I think like the general graphical look is always something that people kind of anchor towards. And most people don't really care what it is. Mm -hmm. Like the general public doesn't care. The real thing where people do care, right? The people who care about the brand or diehards, they want to resell it in the future. Like they care a lot. They don't want this generic shit. But the vast majority of people just want a nice piece of clothing for a good price, I think. And that's why like I'm trying to push this like middle ground where, yeah, my hoodies are like 90 bucks, but it's because like like this hoodie, for example, is like 16 ounce, you know, 100% cotton. Like if this was from Palace or Supreme, it'd be like 180, right? Yeah. But I'm selling for 90. Yeah. But it's like, I want to be that bridge between like, okay, here's a 50-50 Gildan that's people are selling it for $50, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. And like the 150, you know, $200-ish like range. Like I'm trying to hit that middle because like, yeah, my margins aren't as great, but I'm giving accessibility to people who just want higher quality stuff yes. for a price that is, I think, justified because I'm a consumer too. You know, I buy stuff. So it's like, yeah. if I think it's okay, Maybe other people would think, okay, that's like what I think. Um, so yeah, I think like having that brand identity and presence, like whether it's defined by price point or your story or whatever, like I think that's really important for you to be like identifiable. Uh, so my answer is yes. <laughs> uh, like, <Duh. laughs> like, so uh, can you sharing the story of brands just using using a Canva graphic? Like, okay, for a graphic, that's fine. But I'm horrified. Then you would do that in like 10 minutes and go, this is our logo. Much oh, less yeah. if you trademark that, like that's crazy oh, or try to, that's crazy to me. Um, I mean, uh, like, like with no barrier to entry, basically, it does invite like that, right? Like in the time that we're shooting this, this, this video, there's like 10 brands that started, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, I'm going to get the Instagram. Like this is my, my brand with no wherewithal of like, hey can we can we trademark this later or like yeah. or understanding what the long-term vision of it now i love i love what kenji said like respect to people starting like you should start yeah. right so you don't want to be like uh you know analysis paralysis you don't want to be stuck in that mode like you have to take action but i definitely think you have to have forethought so for me i just did a video about this so i was like i think what people should do is have some sort of brand guide or brand story first that you could you could send me, it's like a deck presentation you could send people and say, this is the ethos of the brand. Here's like the logo, like answer all the questions that are like, okay, so what are we really about? And I would also say, can that change? Yes, it can change. But it's like my idea with having a plan. Like don't not have a plan, like have a plan and the plan should change, right? Because because a plane makes like a million different uh, decisions to get to their final destination but have a plan. So like you definitely have to have a brand ID. I, I would say. I love it. Dude, like super valuable, valuable information. And I think that's one thing that like, I'm really, I'm really benefiting from this conversation. Like truth be told. And I know that there's, I, I cannot wait to see the comments because I know there's people out there who are like, how do I start like this? So this is, this is the kind of conversation that I wish I would have stumbled on a few years back when I had my first try, even like right, but even before I worked at heat press nation, even though I didn't know how t-shirts were made, like I definitely had my, my brands all up here, like, oh, I do this, you know? So yeah, it's definitely kind of those, those kind of conversations that I wish I would have stumbled upon a lot earlier. And for those of you guys who don't know, I guess, I don't know how I've gone this long without mentioning it, uh, but sitting at this table is years and years of experience. They both kind of mentioned a little bit uh, window into the past uh, as far as like experience with like professional brands and other brands that you worked with outside and now these guys are doing it on their own. And so I definitely want to recognize that and, and just put that out there for anybody who's wondering, like, well, who, who are they like to tell me to do this? Go check out their Instagrams. I know it's going to be linked in the description. We're not, we're not wrapping up uh, just yet, but you know, I just feel like I want to pause and just like, just say that. Like, don't worry guys. We vetted these guys. Like they, Thanks, their credentials are really good. <laughs> this guy's credentials really good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but man, so I have to ask, you know, I feel like you guys, like, you're, first of all, your stuff's on point, right? You guys wouldn't be here if you had ugly t-shirts, all right? Like, you know, I was just joking around, like, nobody wants an ugly shirt, but, but that's the truth, right? Like, nobody want, is going to buy, a, you know, a, a gross t-shirt. And so when we, look at, when we look at your brands, when I look at your brands, I'm like, that's cool. That's, that's really cool. 
Uh, you know, if somebody, when I, I think the biggest compliment I've ever gotten on my brand is somebody wearing the shirt. Yeah. They thought it was worth the 25, 35 bucks to wear it. Um, but like if another, the parallel of that, if another designer says, that's a cool shirt, I'm like, <laughs> you know, so you, you, got, you guys have cool stuff. And so like you have good insight into, no, nobody has a crystal ball, but you guys have good insight into like kind of what's coming you guys are at least prepared. You have a lot of experience that helps prepare you for incoming trends and stuff. Where do you see the industry going as far as startup streetwear brands is concerned? So, like, where do you see that kind of going in the next maybe five to ten years? Do you think we're going to see, like, bigger strides in, hey, everybody just has heat presses now and we're all ordering our transfers? Do you think, uh, you know, are we, are we going to make the move back to, you know, screen print? Are we his POD the way that everything's going now? Like, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I, I think, I think the barrier entry is still going to be like pretty much little to nothing. Um, I think a good majority of those brands will crash and burn for a lot of the aforementioned reasons here of, of due diligence. Like it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to launch a successful brand. So, um, that will catch a lot of people off guard. They're going to say it's not worth it. Um, but in terms of service and like, uh, like the ones that do succeed, I think they're going to want more options, right? Like there's a lot of content creators or influencers that want their own merch. They meet, I have so many discussions where they realize how difficult it is. So I think the, the 3PL format of not only just like logistics, like, like uh, sh uh, shipping and customer service, like taking care of those portions of it that people don't want to do. I think the Printify, Printful, like um, type companies are gonna are gonna rise so i think there's gonna be more options that way so to once they kind of take off with the brand uh there'll be more vetted companies that could do that i feel like that's like the wild wild west right now yeah um that's what i see yeah yeah i agree with john i mean i love pod honestly like like printful you can clown on it if you want but i've had great experiences on it like okay. but the, the way I present it is, like, you have to kind of know how to give it to them. Like, you mm -hmm. can't just design something and be like, oh, all right, it's going to be fire. You know, yeah, like, there's limitations, right? Yeah. DTG, obviously, like, you got to knock out colors if you want the fabric to show. Mm -hmm. um, for embroidery, like, don't do anything too complicated. Have your lines, like, thick enough and all these little details. But I think with the experience, you can make better choices so that when you get something, it's, like, 80% there. And to me, like, 80% is fine because nothing's going to be 100% perfect every single piece, you know? Like, obviously, I'll love it to be 100%, but... It's asking a little too much. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's an acceptable level where I get it. I'm like, okay, this is acceptable. Like I can sell this. Um, and there are actually some companies that do like POD on LA Apparel and like Independent 5000. Like I actually work with a company in a Fullerton that does that close to your office actually. Oh, nice. um, yeah. I give them a shout out. T-shirt Storm. Like killing it, man. Okay. Like, okay. like they're, we've had our little ins and outs um, getting integrated, but you know, LA Apparel POD, it's like no one's doing that. And like you said, like more people are going to start catching on because when Comfort Color 1717 is the nicest shirt, I think like for most of these companies, it's kind of like you got to push a little bit further now because the blank companies have gotten so much better now too. Like, yes, like th yeah. and that's what's cool is like the similar to the barrier of entry of like, you know, starting the barrier to entry to higher end is also lower too because AS Color made LA Apparel, T-Style, like all these brands, like you can buy these nice blanks for under 10 bucks and for someone that pays two fifty, obviously that's a lot. But like, you know, I don't know. I think the garment's always a foundation to me. So even Definitely. if your design is kind of subpar and small, if your shirt and fit is nice, I feel like you can convince someone to buy it. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest. To, to speaking to that, like, if something's not wearable, like no one's gonna buy another one. Yeah. And like, I love what you said. Like, like, yeah, the design, even if, even if it's not that great, if I find a shirt that I love to wear. That's super comfy. I'm going to just wear it, man. I'm like, okay, I'm not the craziest about the graphic. I'll wear it again. And if I know that this brand uses that blank, like, yes, for sure. I'll be buying another one. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, so um, the other half, like non-beta, obviously it's the brand, but the other half of that entire company, the entire function of it is I want to work with content creators because, like, I'll come across people and I'm like, wow, they – they could sell tons of product. And then it's that like meeting where it's like, hey, I'm trying to do merch. Like, dude, I don't want to be like 
folding all these shirts and sending them out because I have like millions of followers, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the emergence of like killer merch and like any of these companies that will say, hey, we're going to do apparel for a celebrity or a music person. Like for me, I'm like, well, there's literally a whole universe of content creators. And so even my company, I'm saying like in the few, like when I when I started it and I'm like, what does the end look like to me? And I was like, it'd be really fun if I helped other people with their product. So part of that, part of non-beta is just like, I want to work with a lot of other brands because if they come to a point where they're like, this is too difficult or I need to hire someone, I want to be able to partner with people. And the only common denominator I have, besides being interested in what they do, if they're an athlete, like I love MMA, uh, but if you're a professional ball player in any capacity, like that's cool. Or if you're just a TikToker, but if I just like the person, because I don't want to work with someone I don't want to work with. 100%. Yeah. 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 But in a lot of ways, it's me looking. I never thought about this till you asked it. But that's me answering, like, this is part of the future. Like, someone's going to need that. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like if they saw, like, my all my clothing brand mentor stuff from my YouTube channel, they're like, oh, dude, this guy's, like, 20 years plus deep in apparel. Yeah. Like, you, there's no way you can fuck with that 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 resume. But... But this is not an ad for that because I don't I don't want to get like I'm talking about like maybe ten brands and really this is a concierge like I'm working with you because I really like it and there's no limitation because I I just wanted maybe ten brands of like oh that's cool this person is doing this like yeah yeah so that was that's almost like the end that's my opus like that's my dream for non beta or or half of it and so uh, it's part of the answer to that question for me. I think there's a flip side to outsourcing is like a lot of people are taking it in-house too, like the heat presses, the sewing machines. Like you see so many people sewing crazy shit on their own. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, that's all you really need is a sewing machine and like a pattern and fabric, you know? And I think like that's another side of being able to showcase your brand is like having the machine. You cut, It's so much easier to show content if you have a machine. Yes. Like <laughs> okay. I, I will say that like having... Keeping production in house is just a new because you know when you're when you're thinking about like and we were talking about this before we we came on content. when you're thinking about content like okay <laughs> I gotta show this I gotta show this if you're in charge of the process like that's just a whole new yeah, straight put a camera on it yeah yeah exactly so yeah for sure so yeah I think for that benefit as well it's like you get to also learn so when you work with other production companies like you know exactly what to say versus like mm -hmm. you just send someone a tech pack that you bought you know from john site or something and, and you're <laughs> like why does it look different and it's like well because you didn't call your pantones you know it's like yeah. people don't know the logistical things and i think by getting more involved it's like you're also have more skin in the game yeah so you're kind of <laughs> you're tied down to figuring it out as well than just like buying a bunch of stuff be like ah, i'll get to that later you know yeah. so i think it's cool like a lot of in-house stuff like embroidery machines too are becoming more like single head like portable looking like mm. So I think that's really dope to see that. Love it. Man, you guys, this conversation has been I honestly I love it. Like and again, we we so you guys so you guys know like we were talking before we uh before we kind of sat down here and I was just kind of confessing like I I'm, I'm a t-shirt nerd, man. I'm a heat press nerd. I love every aspect of this industry from the finished product that I get to wear to actually producing it and making it. I feel like once I move and get into a place with the garage, like I'm buying a screen print machine <laughs> like <laughs> Like, my tiny house is the only thing keeping me from that, you know. So I'm a, I'm a fan of it through and through, and I'm a fan of you guys. And, uh, yeah, I just really want to thank you guys for, for coming out, for making the drive. Hopefully it doesn't rain uh, on our way home. Looking a little yeah. sketch, but it's all yeah. good. We're getting used to it now. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> turning into Seattle part two. <laughs> Anyways, you guys, hey, this has been the Customizing Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Marbosa. Today, I've been joined by two incredible guests. we got Kenji from I Can Do It Dot Studio, and then my boy John Phenom from Non Beta. Uh, you guys, any any closing words for the audience? Actually, do me a favor. Tell everybody where they can find you, starting with uh, you, John. Uh, if you just Google John Phenom, you'll find uh, all of my <laughs> socials. Uh, yeah, and then you can just email me from hi at clothingbrandacademy.com. Nice. If you Google me, you might find me, you might not, but it's all <laughs> worth a shot. You can find me at I Can Do It Dot Studio for my uh, website, webpage, portfolio. I'm going to buy my stuff. I can do it dot shop and hit me a DM or whatever if you want to chat, and I'll always be there. We'll work on your SEO. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or, of course, you guys can check out the links in the description. Uh, once again, this is Customizing Culture by Heat Press Nation. Thank you all. We'll see you around.